Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the Nobel laureate and also the one of one of the greatest genetists in 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 a, in, a, in the field in the field, Professor Eric Vichaus. He currently the, is the EEB Squibb Professor Emeritus, Senior Research Scholar, Princeton University. And he obtained his bachelor degree from University of Notre Dame in the biology. And his PhD uh, from Yale uh, or in, the, from, in the Department of Biology with Professor Walter Guerin. I didn't realize that Walter Guerin has been the uh, Yale. I always think that he's in the University of Zurich. And so for some of you who know the Walter Guerin, actually did, did his lab discovered and cloned the homeobox genes. Uh, and uh, after that, and uh, Eric went to Professor Rolf Northinger, uh, University of Zurich and Switzerland. And afterward, he has his own lab and uh, as a group leader in the European Molecular Biology Lab in Hamburg, where he and uh, Christina and uh, Nusri Verhart took care of systematic genetic screens to, uh, for studying genetic control of embryonic development in Drosophila, which leading to the Nobel Prize later on. And afterward, they get moved to Princeton, a few years moved to Princeton, and from, you know, right now goes, you know, went through the rank from informative professor, and also been the uh, investigator of the Howe Hughes for many years, before the, uh, uh, become the professor emeritus. Uh, it's very hard to say that, you know, what Eric contributed. Eric contributed so many things to the, into the actually, the developmental genetics. And, um, and I also should mention here, he not only is a great a scientist, also a great mentor. Um, probably he, my, in him, you may not remember, I actually first met the, the Eric when I was a PhD student in the Rutgers. And, uh, and I, I heard Eric's first lecture in the called New York Area Molecular Biology Club, you have remember, in the, not only in the, the, the time of the Roche Institute. And he talked about the gastrulation. After all, I was fascinated by the, the software development. Actually, I went to Princeton actually to, to visit, visit his lab. And at that time, he was, a, he was doing the experiment by himself, actually take the Okay, in the dark room, you remember opposite the office, a smaller room, he actually took a picture of the Safra embryo by himself. That's, I still remember the day, actually the fall of the 1994. And uh, because I was standing, con you know, contribution to, to the to, uh, uh, to Safra developmental genetics, and uh, he won so many awards, I will not get to this, this long list, and uh, I name a few, Nobel Prize, so on the top of the list, and also the member of the National Academy of Sciences, and uh, also the American Academy of Arts and Science, and uh, also the American Philosophical Society. And also become the honorary degree of many universities, including University of Zurich. We are we, we can proud to say, Eric will be one of HKUSD alumni. Tomorrow, he's going to be honored with an honorary PhD from HKUST. Congratulations. And, and also, he served as vice president of many you know, the organizations, and for example, and the Whitehead, and, uh, and National Institute of Genetics, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I don't want to occupy too much of your time and let uh, Eric talk about his favorite subject. And today we can talk about morphogen flattened embryos and a uniform 
plus derm cell fat intracellular. Without further ado, welcome Eric to the podium. Thank you for the introduction. It's one of the most fundamental and fascinating problems in biology is the way that a simple, apparently simple, single fertilized egg develops into a body as complex and as functional as, as any of ours in this room. And over the past, a fascinating problem for biologists over the centuries, and over the past 30 years, we've made remarkable advances in our understanding of that process. And many of the organisms that we work with in the lab, we've learned that already in the egg, before the time that it's even fertilized by the sperm, there is a spatial organization of molecules. And that as the egg divides into, fertilized egg divides into cells, individual cells make use of that cytoplasmic information, those gradients, to choose specific fates to form specific cells uh, of different types. What we've also learned, though, is that while that's characteristic of many of the embryos and many of the animals that we work with in the lab, that other organisms, in particular mammals, don't seem to have this initial organization in the egg and are able to self-generate pattern where no pattern existed before. And so I think one of the challenges for us in developmental biology right now is to bring into a consistent view this, on the one hand, highly deterministic development of patterns that we see in the laboratory organisms that we work with, many of them, like, uh, and the more spontaneous generations of patterns that we see in other organisms. Now, the talk that I'm going to give today is actually, in a certain sense, directed at that problem of organization and lack of organization. But as you'll see, as this is often, and this is often true in science, that one can approach problems that are, are a basic biological interest, but peripherally touch on other biological issues and other problems of biology. And I think uh, that's a characteristic of very much of how research works, that you choose a problem that you think is interesting for a specific reason, and then it can expand in unanticipated directions. So that's the general plan for the talk, my talk today. Now, um, I'll focus, the, as you'll see, the talk will be using the, the model organism Drosophila. It's, um, and over the past 30, 40 years, we've learned that in the Drosophila embryo, in the egg, uh, that, that early, um, uh, that the pattern of the embryo that is uh, dependent on four maternal transcription factors that are supplied in graded patterns in the embryo, and that individual cells at different positions along the anterior, posterior, or dorsal ventral axis of the embryo measure these transcription factors and choose fates, choose whether they're going to be mesoderm or endoderm or head or tail, based on the concentrations of these four proteins. We've also learned that the way these graded distributions arise in the embryo is mechanistically different for each transcription factor. In some cases, the transcription factor is the RNA that encodes the transcription factor is localized in a particular region of the unfertilized egg. In other cases, the transcription factor 
levels depend on cell, cell surface signaling, receptor tyrosine kinases, or other receptors that control the stability of the protein or its localization to the nucleus, or even its translation into um, functional proteins. Now, this is the picture, this is the textbook picture of how early development in the Drosophila embryo is controlled. In Drosophila, we believe that these four transcription factors are the only information that's provided in the egg, and that somehow the embryo is able to translate this maternal graded infra information into highly specific and complex uh, spatial pattern of cell fates. We believe that to be the case largely because the genetic, the mutagenesis experiments that have been done to identify these factors have been done repeatedly. And when one I, examines uh, the uh, different genes, the only genes, the only genetic pathways that have been identified that can maternally control the pattern of the developing embryo either involve these specific transcription factors themselves or upstream genes which are involved in localizing these uh, transcription patterns in, the, in, their, uh, the, in their spatial distributions or controlling their levels. So that's a genetic argument. We say this is the only thing that the only molecules that we know because these are the only ones we can identify. And that's a dangerous argument. It's a useful argument, but a dangerous one. And so several years ago, I set out to test that with the idea that if these, this is the only information, and if you were to genetically manipulate the fly embryo to remove all four of these systems, you should develop an embryo which was now totally uniform in its pattern. Uh, so you can eliminate all four genes, and uh, are the resultant embryos totally unpatterned? And very gratifyingly, the result was that in the quadruple mutant, that, in, it, uh, that embryos that were derived from such uh, mutant, uh, quadruple mutant mothers, instead of producing the highly complex patterns of transcription that one sees in a wild-type embryo, now showed uniform patterns of gene expression, where genes were expressed in one pattern, in uh, either they were expressed or expressed uniformly at a particular level or not expressed at all. So it was very gratifying and argued that this embryo, in a certain sense, was uh, when you eliminate all positional information, it's like a ground state. We'll come back to that idea in a little bit. But this is the basic pattern. It opened up for us at the time an opportunity to reinvestigate the role of these maternal gradients. Because once you know definitively that this is the only information in the egg, then you can take such a genetic manipulation and add back any one of these mutants system, patterning systems by itself, and ask what does the infra, what does each single system do on its own, and then what can it, uh, and then begin to ask how does the embryo begin to add up these information systems to provide a, a determine individual cell fates. So for an example of that kind of, uh, we'll take one of the transcription factors, this is transcription factor Biquet. I won't go into the more complicated genetics involved in these experiments, but what Biquet had been uh, identified as an anteriorly localized RNA that was essential for anterior structures. Interestingly, when you, the embryos, uh, when you eliminate, uh, uh, when embryos have, however, all of the other systems and only have bicoid itself, amazingly, the embryo would not quite make a normal pattern. This embryo is missing some structures in the head and the tail, but forms a substantial part of the abdomen. And what that means is that bicoid isn't just an anterior determinant, that it determines pattern along the, almost the entire anterior-posterior axis of the embryo. And what that means in turn, if one looks at the gradient and measures levels of bicoid, 
that, that controls gene activity way in the posterior regions of the embryo, where we, with our microscopes, actually even have trouble measuring differences. It means that the cells are better at using the information than we are able to, to measure it at the moment. And we know from genetic experiments that if we eliminate bicoid from such an embryo, all pattern goes away, or the anterior posterior pattern goes away. So we know that we're in some way looking at uh, these uh, embryos. We've carried out similar experiments with all of the patterning systems, asking in each case, what do each of them do? And an interesting general rule emerges, which is that in each case, the pattern that the, the embryo is able to make when, it's, when that gene product is the only gene product there is always bigger than the pattern that is eliminated when you eliminate the gene. Traditionally, in genetics, what we do is we knock out genes. We look at the defect. We say what's missing. And we say that the gene must be involved in uh, the, the wild type gene must be involved in making the structures that are missing when you eliminate the gene. And that's a, a powerful way of doing genetics. In a way, what I'm proposing to you is an additional insight is to reverse the logic and say, in these rare conditions, and this is one of the cases where one can actually do this kind of analysis, to ask, what do systems, what are systems re able to do on their own in the absence of all of the other, uh, the other cases? Because when you eliminate a gene, what you're really doing is just asking, what can all the other genes in the embryo do to build that pattern? OK. So, all right, so this has been a, a very useful approach for us, but I want to go back and, and point out to you another uh, interesting feature and one that will actually be the predominant idea in today's talk. And that's that we looked at this, and whoop, back one, and say, uh, we talk about this as though it's a single ground state embryo. Because the particular genotype that we've used here eliminated four genes with the gradients have been flattened. And the transcription factors are either eliminated or present at least at some particular level in the embryo. But actually, if you think about it, if the fates of blastoderm cells are dependent on the measuring the levels of these four different maternal gradients, that actually there are a large number of ground state embryos, because you can have no spatial information. All of the gradients can be flattened. But the transcription factors can be at different levels. And that would, in theory, program cells in the early embryo to different spatial fates, either to be head or tail or mesoderm or muscle or skin. So the idea is to flatten the gradients but come up with different levels. And in Drosophila, hmm. oh, back. we know that that's possible because in addition to having mutations in the transcription factors themselves, we can manipulate the upstream components of the pathway so that we can flatten the gradient but have bicoid or capicua or hunchback or dorsal set at different levels to mimic different regions. The, the, the state at different uh, uh, regions of the blastoderm. And so that idea of that experiment and the question of whether that's possible is going to be the governing idea of today's talk. And the specific plan that is set out is to take, and this is a plan on paper, uh, is to come up with genotypes that will manipulate the levels of transcription factors such that you can determine all of the cells in the embryo to have the, the levels of transcription factors characteristic of this region, or dorsal hindgut, or ectoderm, or mesoderm. Or, and so this is my plan. And this is what I do in the lab, in large, a certain fraction of my time in the lab. Uh, and I will say, about halfway through, with this experiment, 
Uh, we have five lines now that we allow us to determine. Those are the ones in very dark outlining here that allow us to make uh, uh, these genotypes that should produce characteristics. I have some I'm struggling with endoderm. I'm struggling with some specific mesoderm and some certain more anterior problems. There are problems. One difficulty is when you flatten, if you have a certain amount of protein and you have it in a gradient and you flatten it, the levels are low. And so what turns out to be a challenge is to get very high levels that would be, say, for example, characteristic of the anterior most regions of the embryo. There are ways of thinking about how to do this. Many ways, in fact, I can write out on a piece of paper how I think I'm going to do it, and I fail. So we're still kind of challenged for certain ones. But I wanted to give today's, uh, just to give you an update on where we are in this project. So uh, I'll give you an example of the kinds of things. Once we have, it's possible to take ectodermal cells and program them to dors a uniform dorsal or uh, lateral or ventral fates, and we have mark, we can make these genotypes, and then we can test them using antibodies. See, an antibody that's expressed on the ventral side of the embryo or at the posterior end, oops, this should be here and this should be there in the labeling. I'm sorry about that. Uh, this should, is a dorsally expressed gene product called Zen, or there are stripy ones. And what you can see, and interestingly, is just simply by shifting the genotype of one dorsal ventral, we, these embryos lack uh, uh, ventral factors, they lack posterior factors. They differ, though, in the expression, I apologize for that, for, of, of Zen, which is now uniform in the dorsal embryo and totally absent in the lateral embryo. And they all, but they are similar in their high levels of expression of an anterior posterior gene like Runt. You, uh, and, uh, and they, yeah, okay. And, um, you could look at along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. And here we're just going to look at this one particular genotype. Uh, along the anterior posterior axis of fly embryos is an extraordinary precise pattern of, of, of different cell identities that we can follow by using a, antibodies. And if one eliminates all pattern, what one sees is this green gene, which is characteristic of the thorax, is now expressed uniformly over the whole surface of the embryo. Now, we think of this as though all these embryos are, are assigned to the same fate, but the green domain here is actually fairly large. So in our diagram, we'll tend to draw this as a, a, a little square, a blotchy square, uh, a square that would include hundreds of different cell types. But actually, if one looks in greater detail at these embryos, uh, one knows that this crippled expressing domain ultimately gives rise to two stripes of a runt expressing domain that gives rise to something like four stripes of an engrailed expressing domain. And at each level in this process, the, the gene products are I identically expressed. And so this means that uh, what we've, I think what this means is that the embryo that we've made is actually programmed to a single cell fate along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. There is a precision here with respect to the, the, the individual fates of cells. And uh, we can blow this up so that these become equivalent to the runt expressing, cripple expressing, and grailed expressing cell. And we're not actually quite sure which of the two stripes it is. But we believe that actually in generating these embryos, we generate embryos which are extraordinarily precise in the uniformity of their gene expression and therefore the fates of these cells. Similarly for all the other lines that we have made so far. No. So that's where we are right now. That's where I am right now. But what I'd like to do, uh, <laughs> make more lines, is, is to begin to explain and describe to you the kinds of experiments that I envision are going to be possible once we have this collection of lines. And so the next part of the talk will actually have, uh, we we'll call these embryos morphogen flatten. Morphogens are the maternal transcription. And we flatten them. And uh, these are three kinds of experiments that we've begun to do. And this is a shaky part of the talk, because in each case, what we'll see is that we're in the preliminary stages of these analyses. 
and we think they point to exciting results and exciting conclusions. And I'll try to indicate to you at what level the results are uncertain or shaky, or what do we need to do to, uh, next in presenting each of these experiments. So, uh, so part one, proteomics. I've shown you pictures of embryos derived from these various uh, morphogen flattened uh, uh, genotypes and used antibodies to well-known positional markers in uh, Drosophila like snail or cripple or runt or engrailed, which show highly patterned expressions and are directly involved in controlling fates of cells. Most of those factors are transcription, are, are transcri most of those proteins are transcription factors, and the battery of 20 or so antibodies that we've used is almost exclusively genes that were identified as playing critical controlling roles in cell fate. Now, these 20 or 30 Proteins are actually um, uh, low abundance signaling molecules. The vast majority of the 7,000 proteins that are present in the embryo are supplied maternally and are uniformly supplied. So when we say we program a blastoderm to be mesodermal fate or th and dorsal thoracic fate, one question arises is, even if we, at the level of transcription factors, that cell is different, the, prog the differently programmed cell is different, how soon in development does the broad proteome changes change? We know ultimately every differentiated cell type differs in the broad proteome. So question, how soon downstream are decisions in developmental biology translated into broad genomics problems? And so this is a, a, a part of an experiment that, uh, that initiated several years ago with uh, in the, the lab of Martin Moore, who's our mass spectroscopy uh, proteomics guy at, uh, uh, at Princeton. And we have done things in the past where you examine the proteome of entire wild-type Drosophila embryos during development. And I can tell you there are a lot of proteins in a fly embryo, and they go up and they go down on an average kind of level, but there's nothing, it's, it's not very, the data isn't very uh, easy to interpret. Uh, so one of the reasons that Martin uh, is, is suddenly the possibility that if one has a uniform, an embryo that's composed of only a single cell, we can follow we can measure those cells, we can compare one state with another, and we can follow them through development during the course of uh, differentiation. So the experiments are done by Argit Marish, uh, uh, Alega Reynolds, and Ed Cox, who are shown down here. So how soon do differences in cell fate affect broader space? Uh, so I'll show you some preliminary results here. What um, Argit has done here is taken embryos from individual lines, and we're looking at, at, this, at this point, and these are the somewhat preliminary experiments that are in the range of 5,000 proteins, and then asking how, in the blastoderm to an hour and a half, an hour or so after blastoderm stage, uh, blastoderm early gastrolytic extended germ band stages, or something in that general range, how different are proteins? The preliminary experiments suggest that something about Actually, amazing, about 20% of the proteome already begins to show differences in levels. What is curious and unexpected here is that virtually all the proteins that we're looking at are proteins which are themselves maternally supplied. And therefore, the changes in proteome aren't simply due, or may not be due, to changes in, you know, downstream transcription levels, but must have some role in more global, uh, global features. Uh, one of the problems with these results is that while they're reproducible from one line to the next, one of the issues, uh, and therefore dependent on the genotypes, we still have to go back and show that they're really dependent on the 
specific patterning genotypes rather than different genotypes in the, in the overall uh, differences in uh, backgrounds and lines, because lines are going to be statistically different. And so here what one has to do is use, um, I think, using more carefully staged embryos and also sibling controls, and, and that's the experiments here. They're basically, so our results in terms of me being able to name which proteins go up and which proteins go down, we're still at a level where I'm not, we can't do that, but we are convinced to know that there are differences and that we're going to characterize them. Because there are differences, we can also begin to analyze those differences genetically. So it, because this is fly embryos, we can begin to ask which proteins are differences in a particular genotype are dependent on maternally, are maternally supplied and maternal mechanisms, which ones are purely zygotically. In flies, we have a, a variety of techniques that allow us to manipulate the genotypes of the embryos, make an embryo that's missing, for example, the entire left arm of the second chromosome, and then ask, is that embryo that do proteomics on those embryos, and ask whether the level of the protein changes when we remove the chromosome arm that encodes it. That means that that protein is being supplied by transcription. You know, the most directly, that's the simplest interpretation. And the vast, vast, vast majority of our proteins are not affected at all when you remove any particular chromosome arm. And that means, confirms the expectation that most of the proteins are maternally supplied. There's interesting, there are proteins whose presence depend on zygotic transcription. And so when you remove the left arm of the second chromosome, those protein levels fall catastrophically. Curiously, and this is where we're really struggling, there are potentially groups of proteins whose levels shift not quite as dramatically as when you remove the arm that encodes them, but appear to fall down uh, that are encoded on other, on other chromosome arms. And what that suggests is there's some activity on the second chromosome, on the left arm of the second chromosome, which is involved in controlling the levels of protein expression or stability if these are maternally supplied proteins at other levels. And so we're pursuing these experiments because we hope to be able to map not only the changes in the proteome, but what factors downstream of these initial uh, cell fate decisions are uh, controlling, you know, establish those effects. To, because we expect most of the protein changes to be maternally supplied, what we've also begun to investigate is or try to develop strategies for me actually directly measuring protein turnovers of maternally supplied proteins. What this will involve is strategies for labeling proteins and using mass spec to follow the lifetime or the degradation kinetics of all 6,000 proteins in the embryo at the time. And ideally, in homogeneous Drosophila embryos, which are homogeneously programmed to specific fates. The way that Ed uh, Cruz has developed to this, and this, I should say that Martin's lab is primarily focused to use Xenopus as a tool. So we have good data for Xenopus and interesting comparative data for flies is to make use of water in which the oxygen moiety is uh, 18 rather than 16. So this is O18 water. We've chosen water because it and uh, Oxygen and gases are about the only thing which readily move in to a fly embryo simply by immersing the fly embryo. And fly embryos have a, a tough proteinaceous waxy shell. You can put them in alcohol and they will survive. So generally large molecules don't get in, but water is exchanged. So we can add water and then do the uh, proteolytic cleavage and heavy, uh, uh, the water gets uh, incorporated into amino acids that are used then to uh, label newly synthesized proteins. And we can follow pro, uh, proteins, total amounts of proteins and the fraction after a pulse or after a exposure to O18, the fraction of, of the proteins which are not labeled. 
And the general conclusion that we can say so far is that in contrast to Xenopus, where the vast majority of proteins are highly stable, there is a large, a significant fraction of the maternal proteins in Drosophila have rapid turnovers. And we believe even when the total levels of protein are constant, the proteins are turning over. So we think that there is in Drosophila the opportunity for the, 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 uh, a mechanism that will work heavily on controlling specific protein liabilities. And so, I, um, so then to, what this allows us to then uh, begin to follow up on is to ask whether uh, uniform blastoderms have uh, programmed uh, to vascular program to different fates have different protein turnover patterns. For example, whether a lineage has a specific cohort of proteins which are co-regulated in their viability or in their, in their stabilities over time. One important issue and one uh, advantage that we hope that, we'll, uh, that, that, that we believe to be the case in these uh, uniform embryos is that even though one can program all the cells in the embryo to the same fate, a mesodermal fate or a dorsal skin fate, in many cases we can whoa, whoa, that one back. In many cases, these embryos don't well, they don't die immediately, and cells become programmed that are programmed to dorsal skin will go on and make for aficionados, this is typical dorsal skin, or uh, programming to hindgut, uh, which you can see here, the entire embryo at later stages express a gene like, uh, like bra brachyentron, as shown here. And so we know that in some cases, and what this suggests is that cells that are programmed to a specific fate may be able to maintain that memory, maintain that specific fate, and go on and differentiate into that pattern. Now, that's an interesting observation of itself, but we know from our, uh, looking at embryos that actually uh, there are certain regions of the embryo where an apparently homogeneous region gives rise to multiple different cell fates. And so we also want to ask, can we mimic that? And the, uh, do, uh, that's interesting because we can ask, do homogeneous embryos program to certain, uh, certain fates, can they develop into multiple lineages? And the classic example that we, from what we would suspect is the lateral ectoderm in the fly embryo, which like many ectoderms in vertebrate embryos are, are different, give rise to both skin, epidermis, and neural tissue, neuroblast. So, uh, that's called, you can call it the, the lateral ectoderm or the neurogenic ectoderm, gives rise to both the central nervous system in flies and the overlying epidermis. In this embryo here, you have a mesodermal layer, an ectodermal layer, and an intervening layer where neuroblasts have budded off into the interior. You can see them here. They were on cells that were on the surface as part of the ectoderm and move in to form neural, and the cells which remain behind become epidermis. This process is associated with the expression of a number of different transcription factors in these neuroblasts. The example I'm using here is a gene called snail, but there are other transcription factors that are also expressed. This process is an interesting, talking about this in front of Jan, this is embarrassing because I, uh, this is my entry into neuroblast biology, but it's a highly complex process where epidermal, described initially by Chris Doe, where individual cells in the epidermis round up, move into the interior, and then give rise to uh, specific, specific, you know, uh, specific parts of the components in the nervous system. The, the patterns are highly organized highly specific in individual segments such that a neuroblast, and this is early staged embryo, will bud off into the interior of the embryo, reproducibly always in the same place. And it has a name. It has 2-5. Chris was not terribly original in developing names for these individual neuroblasts. And 3.2 comes up a little bit after these. 
And the expression here is associated with um, uh, the delamination of these neuroblasts associated with pattern uh, expression of specific patterning genes that we can see here in Chris's paper, and also with the uh, a remobilization of cell biological machinery that uh, Jan, Jan's lab has described, whereby individual cells, we can see a, a neuroblast moving into the interior here, losing its apical surface uh, due to an accumulation, a pulsing accumulation of actin myosin. So the picture then of these neuroblasts is this formation is this highly regulated, highly patterned uh, process where temporally and spatially the behaviors of cells depend on the positional information within each segment. So we've asked if we program an embryo to a uniform, uh, to uniform lateral ectodermal fate, which fate do we get? Do they all stay ectoderm? Do they all stay neuroblasts? What actually happens? And the answer is that they do both. Even though at this stage, of previous blasted obtained cells look totally uniform. What one sees is here you can see these little neuroblasts budding off in this embryo. Ah, and I, I didn't do this in color, but this is Snell express, they express these. And potentially even more interestingly about these embryos, these embryos which have ectodermal cells left on the surface and mesodermal and, and, and neuroblast cells in each go on to differentiate both skin and uh, final differentiative markers like LAV. So the only real difference is that whereas in the normal fly embryo, these neuroblasts have this extremely uh, extraordinary pattern of neuroblasts budding off into the interior with expressing different particular genes at the, in different places, what you have here, a diversity of neuroblasts moving into the interior with no pattern, but still a diversity of different expressions. I think we're looking at a uh, hunchback and snail and uh, runt, I believe. So they become, so we're building the embryos able to self pattern a uniform sheet to give rise to this diversity of neuroblasts. Ah, that's, although interestingly, not the only pattern that's spontaneous, is spontaneously generated. Um, the uh, ectoderm itself that we were looking at uh, has, uh, has its own spatial pattern, even after the neuro, certainly after the neuroblast leave. Uh, the surface of it has been highly studied in Drosophila. It's one of the central patterning elements. Most of you know, again, from textbooks that, you know, pattern as initially established by these maternal gradients and read out into a collection, a set of genes called gap genes that are then translated into a pattern of parallel gene expressions with increasing precision along the anterior posterior axis, and then ultimately into a set of genes that are called segment polarity genes, which are expressed in these one cell wide stripes in the embryo. Uh, this expression depends, this pattern of expression depends on uh, initially on these genes here, but once, uh, uh, and as the embryo develops, for, but it's main, unlike these which are transient in expression, this engrailed wingless expression pattern is maintained throughout the remainder of the embryo and gives rise to the segmental pattern. The, although the pattern is initially uh, uh, produced or caused by the, these early segmentation genes, but once these parallel genes are gone, the pattern is maintained by a set of interactions between the engrailed expressing cells and the wingless expressing cells, and they, well, they have a set of rules. What the, basically the, the system is, is that both genes exclude the expression of the other gene in the same cell, but are essential for, to promote the expression of the gene in neighboring cells. So we can draw this in a diagram like this. 
where the wingless expressing cells inhibit local engraldic synthesis but enhance expression. And engraled inhibits local wingless ex expression in, in the individual cell but enhances the expression. So what we've done is ask what happens in an unpatterned ep epidermis that doesn't have pair rule inputs or does, it has pair rule inputs but doesn't have a pair rule striped pattern. And what we can see here is that normally a wild type embryo would have stripes of pair rule genes and would give rise to wingless and engrailed in this complicated pattern of reproducible area pattern. In embryos which are now programmed to lateral ectoderm, rather than having stripes of pair rule expression, one has stripes of a single pair rule gene called runt, which is then converted into stripes of a single one of these genes, engrailed. Runt goes away, and then a remarkable thing happens. Oh, this picture is even more beautiful if we would turn off the lights, but it's OK. Um, for just a second, just because I, it's a beautiful picture. Try, uh, but these are the ones that you. That's better. Yes. That within this uniform expression, as runt expression goes in, and grailed expression begins to become lost, uh, and apparently in a, a pattern emerges. And what you can see is patterns of engrailed juxtaposed to patterns of wingless. So this is building on this random stoke, this pattern from an initially uniform state builds on stochastic noise in variability and how levels are lost, and then this internal amplification system. That, and what, what, can we go back one? Uh, what is in contrast to wild type patterns, all of which look the same, each of these embryos looks different from each other. There are certain rules. The constant rule is the juxtapositions rule. Well, we, uh, we don't know yet the, the, the length scales of these processes. But uh, one of my goals right now is to, this is one of the first easily observable self-organization systems that have been identified in, in, in Drosophila. There's, Drosophila, is, it, because it develops so rapidly, is highly deterministic and mechanistic. In every step uh, determines the next step. And there are patterns, as we see in the cytoplasm of the egg, that are ultimately translated into complex patterns. And it contrasts with mammalian development, where patterns seem to be arise spontaneously in, uh, by circuits that can self-organize. And what this result demonstrates is that flies potentially have these same kind of circuits, but the rules are here. Oh, and I should say that this animal is not normal. So we don't get a normal pattern, but we have aspects of the self-organization that become mechanistically useful to identify. Interestingly, the property of self-organization might also be limited to certain regions of the embryo. The dorsal ectoderm appears not, it loses these activities and remains unpatterned. Doesn't show this, uh, at least with uh, anywhere near the frequency that one has lateral patterns, uh, the patterns in the, in the lateral ectoderm. And so obviously, what we would like to do is to identify the rules involved, identify the genes involved, the characteristic length scales, begin to test the models for self-generation. This would give us an opportunity, because I think it, even though mammalian embryos have many beautiful examples of self-organization, it's still more difficult to study the in-depth mechanisms of self-organization in a mammalian embryo. And the, my hope is that having a, a laboratory model system like Drosophila, which is so easily manipulatable at so many levels, we can get down to the deeper phenomena associated with uh, what are most likely what we can think of as 
pattern, self-organization of the same kind uh, proposed by Turing. OK, so the very last thing, a couple of preliminary results just because of uh, to do with tissue mechanics. All right, so normally, an embryo forms a cellular blastoderm stage and then undergoes a process of gastrulation where the embryo transforms its morphology because different regions of the embryo move in or fold or expand or do different processes. And so now we've done something. If we made an embryo where all the cells are the same, can it gastrulate? And if it gastrulates, uh, how does it uh, do that? I have to point out, hmm. oh, good. Uh, that uh, our work on gastrulation and then uh, worked on gastrulation for some time is a beautiful, incredible uh, process. Uh, has taken the leap forward due to some work by Tomer Stern, who has developed strategies and pipelines for um, uh, not only segment, but taking 3D light sheet data that allow us to track all cells in the embryo and all different views, reconstruct the behaviors of individual cells, and um, follow their crossover back one. And then allows us to track individual cells, follow them through the whole process of gastrulation, and ask where do cells, not only where cells go, but what are the, um, the this is ventral furrow forming, mesodermal cells going into the interior. This is a pro, that's the endodermal cells moving in and individual cells. Tomer has also developed a computational strategy that allows us to use these movies in a template-based system of identifying uh, behavioral motifs. So the system that Thomas is very similar to blast searches for DNA homologies, but uses groups of cells. So you can choose in a movie a set of four cells, say a quartet of cells, and then ask the program to take all of the other quartets of cells in the same embryo, 100,000 of them, and rank all their behaviors, identify all the cells which are showing uh, uh, comparable behaviors in the same way that in a blast search, we search through the genome and rank DNA sequences according to their similarities. One of the things that has been able to do then is to plot out and quantify the behaviors of gastrulation. So one of the things that happens early in the embryos, and now we're depicting this embryo as though it's kind of spread out, opened up, and he is coloring the cells which disappear from the surface during the first 40 minutes. This is prior to neuroblast invagination, so but this is largely mesodermal cells here and here, endodermal cells, and certain epith epithelial folds, the cephalic furrow. These are lost from the surface, and then the remaining cells on the blastoderm surface. This is a blastoderm plot. These cells are going to be lost. And what we know is that about 50% during early gastrulation of the entire surface of the embryo is lost by internal invaginations. And so what that means is the embryo doesn't fall apart, that the rest of the embryo that's left on the surface has to compensate for that loss. And we know that the way that it compensates, the cells maintain constant volume, but increase their surface area and become shorter. So we have usually thought in the lab, and this is a bias based on nothing other than intuition and, and bias, that this is a passive response of individual cells, that mesoderm is lost, goes into the interior, and this stretches the overlying ectoderm. one actually follows gastrulation in embryos where we've eliminated, we've programmed all the cells to ectoderm. So there is no mesoderm. There is no endoderm. There is no cephalic flow. There is nothing lost. And we follow the One possibility is they would just sit there and do nothing during gastrulation. But what they actually do is shorten and become bigger and wider. 
And as a consequence of that, what happens is the whole surface of the embryo wrinkles up like this. And so what that suggests is that this process, part of gastrulation, is an active process in the ectoderm where the ectoderm expands. That's been suggested by other labs. I've never liked the idea that much. But I think it's um, <laughs> probably, you know, the whole reason I guess we do science is to prove ourselves wrong. And so um, we, uh, so this is an ex exciting possibility. It's exciting, that's uh, insights in the normal gastrulation, but actually in a sense that this is interesting because we now, again in the same argument of the proteomics, that building a simple embryo allows us to begin to ask questions about specific properties. Not only proteomics, but say physical properties. If all of the cells of the embryo have the same physical properties, then uh, how does an embryo behave? And so, for example, we'd like to know tissue buckling. If a tissue uh, expands but is constrained, there are uh, physical, biophysical, whether the tissue buckles, whether it ripples, and what the length scale of the ripples are. This just comes from you know, the mechanics and from the physical properties of the sheets. And so what we've begun to investigate is do all homogeneous embryos ripple? or And that appears to be so far that it's predominant. Ooh, predominantly ectodermal cell types, and mesoderm, and we haven't been able to get in it, to, uh, and we need to get anterior cell type to, uh, uh, again, what you want to know is what are the proper, uh, is this a, a region-specific property? And then even within the ectoderm, are all ectodermal cells similar to each other, or mechanistically, or from a structural tissue, to, is the, periodicity of the wrinkles that are formed the same? That would, or are they different? And that would then point to differences in the actual physical properties of the sheets of cells at this time. OK, so I'm going to stop there. But what I wanted to do is uh, give you a, a sense of what can be done with these uh, uniform embryo and, and, and the idea that we can make them and that they have interesting properties. Uh, and then speculate a little bit on the kinds of questions. Uh, changes in proteome, it's still shaky, but we believe exist. You know, we've shown that these embryos can self-pattern. Some of them may maintain fates. That ability to self-pattern may be specific. And regions of the gastrula may differ in, in, in tissue properties and behaviors. Uh, I did some of these experiments myself. Um, but um, obviously, and this is the way science works, that um, the, real, the real advances, the real um, excitement, it depends always on interactions. And, and I think I've been particularly gratified by the, the, the potential of the, the, the proteomics work with Martin and his little subgroup of, of fly people. Also, it's been a wonderful collaboration with uh, Stas Schwartzman and, and, and particularly Tomer Stern on developing computational approaches to characterize uh, behavior cells at gastrulation. So I'll stop there. Take any questions that you have. If, if, uh, that. So after this stimulated talk, talk, I hope you have some questions. I can ask first question. Let them think a little more. Um, why do you show that, that you know when the old cell look, look like an old become the neural ectoderm? Yeah, they still kind of buckling and actually the, the, the epithelial actually protrude inside the embryo. Yes, look like they still maintain epithelial characteristics. Is that true? I yes, right. Ah, so the epithelial cells remain, or the ectodermal cells that remain on the surface remain epithelial. Oh, the, 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 the and the, the cells that move into the moves. interior, the neuroblast, have not examined them in great detail, but they, by my estimate, do lose their epithelial quality. So this is like an EMT 
but a single cell based based DMT. I see. Does, yeah, so I think that's the, the proper, I think it is a, one of the things that we, that I'm struggling to develop is tools for analyzing the development of these embryos that don't rely so heavily on fixed material and antibody studying, which I think is very powerful and very convenient and very quick. But many of the questions that we're dealing with have a, have a time element to them. And so following the elimination, the elimination of neuroblasts in these embryos will become a powerful, we think if we can do it in real time, and under, we'll be able to understand the spatial rules involved. In, and, and it's just slightly more complex. I'm, you know, I'm bold enough with respect to genetics that I believe, yes, I can make those stocks. But it's, um, I also am experienced enough to know that very often when I think I can do something, that it takes two or three or four tries before I ever actually get something to work. And so, yeah. OK, yes. Yes. Oh, whatever. Yes. OK. Thank you for your wonderful talk. And I have some questions in your part two, self-organization. And have you ever counted numbers of cells uh, ingrained positive and wingless positive? So I'm just curious whether these cells in the mutant, they have, somehow they know their fate in advance yes. uh, and maintain. OK. So uh, the answer, the strict answer to your question is, have I ever counted? Not yet. Right. The general observation, though, is that the embryos are as I pointed out, variable in their patterns. But I can have um, more or less. Sometimes there's only two or three spots of local pattern. And sometimes there are massive, global, beautiful images. I, you know, If I have to pick what image I'm going to show you guys, I want to pick, show you the prettiest one. And so I've maybe falsely chosen the most beautiful image. So I suspect that's not the case. I, I think one of the advantages of developing a live embryo-based protocol is the ability to look at the blastoderm stage, say, using a marker like in Grailed, and measuring as carefully as possible what is the stochastic variation, what is the variation in engrailed levels, and then asking whether there are any predictive features for what cells maintain in grail, which cells lose in grail. Try to develop. Those are the kinds of things that I, I imagine will be very informative. I haven't done them yet. OK, second question is that even though they are showing this in grail positive or wingless positive, I'm just curious whether they are like fully functional. So if you like transplant this ingrained positive cells from mutants and transplant them into just wild type uh, embryo in the like yeah. correct position, then can they develop into like this wild type like cells right. okay. or we, like? Yeah, we don't. That's a good question. We don't know. Uh, what I can say is that, and this is something I'm struggling with, in the, is that. These, em these embryos die because they were fixed. And I can allow them to continue development. And depending on the line and the stock and the conditions, a certain fraction of them make it all the way to cuticle. So I, and among the cuticles that I see, and I have to emphasize, this is a small, a frustratingly small fraction of the embryos make it this far. There are some which are uniform in their pattern, and some which are swirly patterns of denticles that would suggest that the patterns that are being established 
in these early stages, in terms of engrailed and wingless, go on to effectively pattern the cuticle. Now, what I'm really desperately trying to do is to figure out how to increase the numbers, because that would be a very powerful way of analyzing the system. And this just means that crosses out. You're trying to clean up the system, trying to get, uh, trying to figure out, is there a good temperature, a bad temperature? These embryos have no stomach. They have no gut. They have no sources of energy so that they would peter out. They have yolk, but you know, there, there's certain challenges that these embryos. There are certain challenges that these embryos face. It's not good for a fly embryo to start out with no maternal information. <laughs> It's, it's, so they are doing their very best for me, but um, I don't know. <laughs> so I just have to get them, help them to do a little bit more. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. OK, good. Uh, oh, can I? Uh, yeah, you're first. Uh, you, you can go first. OK. So, OK. Thank you, Professor, for the amazing work and the irreplaceable contribution to our life science. My first question is, uh, is hard to imagine how this key maternal factor regulates so many proteins in the different region. Yeah. Um, how about the, I mean, the, the self the in, interplay or self-regulation of this key maternal factor like NANOC, like the hatchback or the big D? Yeah. So what I think happens, uh, and I'm, uh, I tend to favor deterministic, simple, hierarchical ha systems for describing development, that the transcription factors that establish particular fates, establish that fate. And we know from molecular studies that if you look, um, do transcriptomics, that downstream there are four or 500 different gene products that are regulated by twist or snail or in grail. Among those gene products, we suspect, might be proteins that would, in an interesting way, specifically target the lifetime or stability of cohorts or groups of proteins in a tissue-specific way. And so we have the Transcription factors at the level of cell fate determination, they would control um, among their downstream targets uh, physiological properties, uh, phosphorylation, uh, you can imagine, that would in some way control. We have no idea. And so obviously, a very optimistic hope for these experiments would be that they begin to point to mechanisms for global control of uh, protein degradation or protein lifetime uh, degradation. Uh, until now, about 10 scientists uh, uh, won six Nobel Prize to have any pre prediction or if it's possible for the future and other <laughs> so, so <laughs> like, scientists can earn the next Nobel Prize. I, you know, I, <laughs> the problems are hard. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, there we are, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, regarding the proteomic part, it's stimulating. So uh, related to that, I have two questions. For, first one is that uh, I was thinking about genetic screening uh, because maternal uh, maternal gene are, are abundant yes. and zygotic as as far as your uh, right. your data shows, yes. it's small amount. So maybe genetic screening to find out the uh, essential essential component for the uh, very early in embryogenesis has to be done in the next generation, is it? Yeah. Um, I think that's true. And uh, the, the question is always in genetics, what is the best strategy mm -hmm. for such a screen? It's since when and a strategy in a genetic screen often depends on you having an expected phenotype and you screen for that phenotype. We don't know what, it's hard to predict phenotypes. And so I think I would favor, I would favor a genetic screen that's based on mass spec. Okay. That is horrible. <laughs> but then what that means is you're not going to do a thousand different lines, from, you know, whatever you do. In it. So that's why we're enthusiastic about the chromosomal deletions because we know that in 
four or five uh, uh, collections of embryos, we can delete substantial fractions of the genome. And if we can identify something that has a, an effect on proteome, on the proteome constitution, on chromosomes other than the arm that we're deleting, and if we have a tool that allows us to actually measure protein turnover, and to show that this is an effect based on protein turnover, then it becomes fairly straightforward in Drosophila to map or to identify the gene involved in that, oh, yes. uh, in that lifetime uh, uh, determination. Uh, so I'm enthusiastic about genetics, but I'm scared, having done it in the I, past, it uh, can be a scary uh, kind of thing unless you know what you're doing. Uh, OK. The, uh, the next question is I really want to uh, hear your opinion. So if we are, uh, they depend on maternal gene expression. So uh, what's the uh, evolutional and biological meaning? So uh, if the offspring having mutation, the mutant phenotype may be masked by maternal uh, expression. Yeah. So it may be biologically disadvantage to produce the offspring which has mu serious mutation, which yeah. phenotype is masked by the uh, maternal gene. It's, mm. Yeah. My sense is that ultimately genes are tested in the evolutionary niche that the animal lives in at some point. And when, but organisms, depending on when they're supplying the crucial activity and how crucial it is, the selection could occur in one generation or it could occur in the previous generation. So as you modify, uh, the, the, I think there will always be a selection on genes. I think that as what has happened in flies and is different from mammals is that flies have evolved into a system of, uh, they have a, a system of competitive larval development where you want to maximize the, how rapidly an embryo develops. And the embryos that develop more slowly were kind of eliminated by the ones that uh, more rapidly. And, and that's generally true for lar many larval forms. And so they maximized maternal contributions and minimized zygotic contributions. And uh, whereas I think mammals would work the other way, that they've maximized zygotic contributions. They rely on the mom. but after the first couple of, uh, certainly after the first uh, couple of weeks of, of a, a human development, all of the gene products in a mammalian embryo are made by the embryo itself. A very, very, I would predict most of them, that uh, the protein turnover, is particularly because the embryo is growing. And so I think that you balance those things. When selection, and then you have these systems, and when selection occurs, it's going to depend on the particular solution, but it's in a way irrelevant. It's not worth your time to try to think too much of what's, you know, relative maternal contributions versus say, the system is going to, will work in some way, and you're select, you'll select for those genes. So if you have a defective gene, I, I doubt you're really going to, whether you, whether you rescue it in the mother and then die later or not, it doesn't really matter to me. I guess that would be my reaction philosophically. Philosophically, because I have no data on that. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. It's speculative. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Eric here. So, for those buckling embryos, so what sort of, you said is this like a shortening and there's a stretching is kind of uh, active, not like uh, passive yeah. thing. So, what's the trigger that? And also, in this, like a flattened embryos, what happened to cell division? Do, do in some embryos, cells divide more or some or not? Okay. Really? Yeah, so uh, the, the, what happens in cell division is something that we're in the middle of looking at. There are ultimately divisions. They appear, unlike the regular fly embryo, which is where the patterns of division are extremely localized, they appear over the whole surface. They are not completely synchronous, but occur at some time. I don't have good quantitative data beyond that. 
with respect to flatten your question. Uh, what, what triggers those oh, to flatten yeah. and... It's interesting. In a way, um, what triggers flattening or this flattening process, and it's actually an interesting hard problem because you now have an embryo which is totally uniform. You could have imagined in the passive model that flattening was triggered because some cells left the surface. And so you, you, you build your timing on But when you have an embryo which is totally uniform, what that means is that in some way, those cells are measuring time. That they have an internal, and then it becomes the same question as for ventral furrow. What, why do those cells, what triggers that what caused, how is timing controlled? And I, in a way, the uh, homogeneous embryos become an interesting opportunity to study that because we eliminate pattern and yet we still have a temporal pattern. And how that's controlled, whether there's a genetic experiment or a genetic strategy to get your hands on it, I, I, I haven't, I, I I don't, I don't know. Maybe, I hate this, uh, I, but a quasi-genetic experiment like a pharmacological <laughs> experiment or an RNAi injection experiment at some level begins to be more attractive than to think about the sextuple or the quintuple of uh, uh, a five or six mutant combination, which is, ah, which is really hard. And, and so already with four or five maternal mutants together, that is doable. And so maybe at this point, I, this would be very hard for me to accept. But I have injected an embryo. I, I would be willing to do injections if that was the only way to actually solve the problem. Yeah. Heath. So, uh, speaking of complicated genetics. Um, <laughs> the, in the Hanga embryo, um, why, why is it hind gut and not mid gut? Do you not have talus expression because of the capicua deletion? All right, so we don't. Yeah, so right now we don't have. We have talus expression and we have. Um, we do not have hookabine expression. We have brachyentron expression in what we call uh, hind gut I see. embryos. What I have struggled with. I'm doing this for you as an aficionado <laughs> that is really deeply involved in this, to tell you that in making endoderm, I have been able to get embryos, which I think should be, from my genetic plans, should be endoderm. They express hookabine, which was great as the endodermal marker, but they haven't turned off the hindgut marker. So they continue to express. So I don't know whether I've hit some weird intermediate zone or whether there's something about the system that we don't understand. So I, so I kind of set those experiments aside and come up with a new cross to get more extreme endoderm. And because what I want, ideally, are cell types in uniform embryos that mimic the cell states that one finds in a normal blastoderm. That's not absolutely essential for all of the experiments that we're doing, but it is certainly the gold standard of being able to make endoderm, and right now the endoderms that I've made, the endoderms that I made, don't seem to behave the same way that real endoderm in an intact embryo behaves. And I don't know whether I've hit hit the right level, or whether there's something about the circuitry that we don't understand yet. So, th so the marker they're still expressing is brachyneuron. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, the, and also on the, uh, the experiments you're doing with uh, the mass spec experiments you're doing with Martin, uh, the, um, in some of the chromosome deletions, there's a few genes that go up. Um, do you have any thoughts on those? Right, or no. I mean, you could imagine uh, uh, protein levels can depend on, you'd like to know whether those are transcriptionally controlled or whether protein lifetimes can be regulated in both directions. <clears throat> if you're constantly turning over a protein, and the, my favorite one in this class is a beta-catenin, which has a very short lifetime, and you put in a signaling element, and suddenly proteins accumulate to high levels, and this isn't transcription, 
This is just the stability of the, you've, you've eliminated a mechanism that causes the protein to have a short lifetime. And so that would be exciting. Uh, those cases are relatively rare. We're, I have no idea where we really are in, in, in these experiments yet. Thanks. A quick follow-up on the apical shortening. Uh, is it possible it is a, uh, because in, during sterilization, the cells get stretched too long, and they just, like elastic thing, they just slowly coming back. If you stop sterilization in the middle, do they still do the AP shortening? <laughs> Don't know. The uh, question is, if you, if you started out making shorter cells, <laughs> as there were a mutant that made shorter cells. Yeah. Actually, there was one, we slam, or there are mutants which would make shorter cells. In a way, the, my prediction, ooh, yeah, it's an interesting experiment. And the passive prediction would be that you're still removing cells and the cells should still get shorter. Yeah. But in the active, whether the active mechanism, whether it's an elastic transition or whether there's something else, or the cell has an ideal sense of what length it should be and then goes to that length if it's too long. But if you started the cell off as being too short, it doesn't go to that length. Uh, don't know. That'd be cool and interesting to see. Students? No, i ask last question. So the issue that the you know, embryo have the self-organization ability. I look at the pattern, especially in grill, positive cell, always aggregate together in the center. Yeah. Look like uh, you know, when it's actually always surrounding. Right. Because it's very much like actually catenary media cell adhesion. They always self-organization. Have you looked at catenary? Right. Yeah. Actually, yeah. high express in the in grill, positive cells? The catenary, or? Catenary, yeah. yeah. Have not would be in the process of, of doing that. There is, though, an interesting feature that you pointed out yeah. that you have. There is a polarity, yeah. apparently a polarity in the pattern, in that you have non-expressing empty black cells, and then green wind cells, and then highly purple and grilled cells, and then a kind of a drifting down to Low level, you know, in, in, in grilled, and and I think dynamic analysis. It would be very interesting to know: um, uh, is it can we trace that back to how cells are lost, and then it's only cells at the edge that are being maintained, and and the other ones are just lagging behind. I there kind of makes you want to go back, get back in the lab that's, tomorrow that's morning. Right. <laughs> Okay, and uh, let's thank the Professor Vershaus again for great talk and, and uh, stimulating discussion. Thank you.